Welcome to Mega 10. I am Monica. And I am David. A quick reminder, please give us a like, hit the bell, and subscribe to our channel. You can also join the VIP front row to get early access to all our upcoming videos. Thank you for being here and supporting us. Okay, David. I've been looking closely at how Ripple's blend of custody, stablecoin issuance, and tokenization is quietly reshaping the landscape of institutional blockchain adoption in Europe. It's not just a tech upgrade, it's becoming a new financial architecture. You're absolutely right, Monica. The way Ripple's ecosystem is structured now, it's like a complete vertical stack for institutions. Custody through Medico and standard custody, tokenization via XRPL's multi-purpose tokens, and liquidity through Ripple USD or RLUSD all sit under one umbrella. And with the Hidden Road acquisition, the settlement, brokerage, and risk infrastructure are all converging. The European market is the perfect testing ground. MICA, which came into force recently, is setting the most harmonized regulatory standard in the world for digital assets. Institutions finally have clarity on what qualifies as compliant issuance, custody, and trading. Ripple's decision to anchor much of its architecture in Europe makes strategic sense. That clarity gives them a real edge. By securing virtual asset service provider status in Ireland and aligning RLUSD with NYDFS standards that already satisfy most prudential expectations, Ripple has made itself a bridge between the US and European regulatory worlds. The alignment means a bank in Germany or France can transact with RLUSD knowing it's under frameworks both sides recognize. It's a clever regulatory play. They've turned compliance into competitive advantage. What stands out for me is how Europe's major banks like DZ Bank and BBVA are experimenting with Ripple-powered custody and tokenization frameworks. Ripple isn't pitching crypto speculation. It's selling infrastructure to financial incumbents. And it's working. DZ Bank, for example, has tokenized hundreds of billions in assets using Ripple's custody and XRPL settlement tools. Those pilots under Germany's EWPG regime demonstrate tokenization that fits within the European securities law framework. That's a milestone. Exactly. And with Ripple USD entering the picture, the ecosystem gets a stable settlement asset. RLUSD isn't just another stablecoin. It's fully regulated, backed by U.S. Treasuries and cash equivalents at BNY Mellon. That gives institutions something they can use as the on-chain equivalent of cash. It changes the settlement logic. On one ledger, you've got both a volatile bridge asset, XRP, and a stable, FIAT-backed asset, RLUSD. Together, they form what Ripple calls a hybrid liquidity model. The RLUSD provides the steady base currency, while XRP provides cross-border efficiency. That dual model could become standard in institutional corridors. The results are showing in cost savings already. Cross-border corridors like the Portugal-Brazil route handled by Unicambio are seeing up to 70% reductions in settlement costs, and that's with regulatory oversight intact. Another layer is the acquisition of Hidden Road, now rebranded as Ripple Prime. For the first time, a blockchain company owns a prime brokerage that processes trillions in annual clearing volume. That's not about retail investors, that's institutional plumbing. Prime brokerage convergence is crucial. Traditionally, clearing, collateral management, and settlement have been separate. Ripple Prime integrates them on XRPL, so trades can be executed and settled atomically with instant collateral updates. It cuts out the days of pre-funding and reconciliation. And the timing couldn't be better. Basel III's upcoming implementation phases make capital efficiency the holy grail for banks. If Ripple can offer same-day settlement and programmable collateral via RLUSD, that directly supports Basel's liquidity coverage and capital adequacy goals. That's the irony, isn't it? Regulators demanding more transparency and speed might have accidentally created the perfect environment for Ripple's model. Because XRPL offers deterministic settlement, it can satisfy risk management requirements that old systems never could. Precisely. And now with XRPL's permission domains and credential features, it can meet institutional compliance without losing its public character. Institutions can verify participants through on-chain credentials, lock access to KYC-verified entities, and still benefit from the efficiency of public settlement. That selective permissioning model might be the most innovative piece. Instead of choosing between a closed enterprise blockchain and a chaotic public one, Ripple's approach is hybrid. It lets banks and regulators maintain oversight where necessary while still using an open ledger. It's also shaping how DeFi evolves. Institutional DeFi isn't about anonymous yield farms anymore. It's about liquidity pools, AMMs, and on-chain markets that meet compliance checks automatically. If you think about it, the architecture of XRPL, with features like deep freeze and clawback, gives issuers legal comfort that assets can be frozen or recovered if something goes wrong. 
and that's essential for mainstream adoption. If a central bank or large asset manager wants to issue tokenized bonds or funds, they need to know that there's a protocol-level compliance mechanism. XRPL provides that. That brings us to the XRPL Foundation's governance setup. Incorporating under French law is a strategic masterstroke. It creates legal clarity for European institutions who can now see the ledger as governed within their own legal culture. The choice of France over the U.S. also signals a shift away from the perception that Ripple is too American-centric. It gives the XRPL Foundation jurisdictional neutrality and global legitimacy. And the amendment mechanism makes it adaptable. Requiring an 80% validator consensus ensures stability, but the ability to amend the Constitution lets XRPL evolve with regulatory demands. It's like a built-in regulatory sandbox without forking the network. That flexibility is vital as MICA continues to evolve. Europe's regulatory environment is comprehensive, but it still allows innovation. Ripple's architecture mirrors that spirit. Strong guardrails, but space to experiment. The most interesting part for me is how RLUSD might set the template for permissionless stablecoins globally. Its NYDFS approval sets an institutional precedent for how reserves, redemption, and audits should work. Other stablecoin issuers will have to rise to that level or risk being sidelined. It could also influence MICA's supervision of asset reference tokens. If RLUSD is treated as equivalent to an e-money token under MICA, it gives Ripple a passport into European markets without reissuing under EU law. And that creates a cross-regulatory settlement layer as much as a financial one. Just a reminder, remember to like, share, and subscribe. And also, don't forget, there is a front row seat waiting for you. Join us here at the VIP area. Thank you, Monica. Coming back to institutional adoption, the partnership ecosystem around XRPL is expanding fast. We're talking about players like BNY Mellon, Ondo Finance, and Guggenheim Treasury Services. Each of them brings a layer of legitimacy. Tokenized U.S. treasuries, commercial paper, and even real estate assets are now being settled directly on XRPL. It's significant because it shows that tokenization isn't just theory. The multipurpose token standard allows issuers to embed attributes like maturity, tranches, and compliance flags directly at the protocol level. No need for complex smart contracts. That's how tokenization becomes practical for regulated assets. And these tokens interact naturally with RLUSD liquidity pools. It's becoming a closed loop. Stablecoin for cash leg, tokenized asset for securities leg, and XRP bridging cross-border. That's a full delivery versus payment system running entirely on XRPL. The integration of prime brokerage functions through Ripple Prime completes the circle. Institutions can finance, margin, and settle in the same ecosystem with full transparency and immediate finality. The ripple effect, pun intended, is that traditional custodians and CSDs will have to adapt. Their role will shift from settlement intermediaries to collateral managers and reporting agents. They'll manage tokenized collateral, calculate haircuts, and report regulatory data. But the atomic settlement will happen on ledger. That will require coordination with central banks and market regulators, of course. But we're already seeing openness. The ECB's DLT pilot regime and the Bank of France's multi-currency corridor experiments are early signs. It's becoming clear that regulators are no longer trying to block blockchain. They're trying to domesticate it. Ripple's approach gives them the tools to do that without fragmenting the ecosystem. Still, there are risks. If RLUSD becomes the dominant base pair, market concentration could create systemic dependencies. A loss of confidence or technical issue could cascade through liquidity pools. True, and that's why prudential frameworks are evolving. Regulators may treat large stablecoin issuers like systemically important institutions, requiring capital buffers and stress tests. Ripple's banking relationships and transparent governance put it in a good position to meet those expectations. The open validator model also supports that resilience. Because validators are known entities, universities, financial firms, and infrastructure providers, there's accountability. It's decentralized, but not anarchic. That's the balance that regulators want. Decentralization with identifiable responsibility. If a public ledger can maintain that, it can play in the same league as critical financial utilities. Which leads us to a bigger question. Could XRPL eventually be classified as critical financial infrastructure? If it keeps processing institutional transactions at this scale, it might meet those thresholds. It's possible. The challenge is that financial market utilities are normally single operators with recovery and resolution plans. XRPL's distributed nature doesn't fit neatly into that model. 
but the Foundation and Ripple's partnerships could form a hybrid structure that regulators recognize. We've seen precedents. SWIFT itself is integrating blockchain protocols for transparency, and BIS projects like Cedar and Horus are proving that distributed settlement can meet the principles for financial market infrastructures. If XRPL achieves that recognition, it would change how public ledger blockchains are perceived. It would no longer be an alternative. It would be part of the financial backbone. And that brings us to the philosophical shift. The line between decentralization and regulation is blurring. With domain-level permissioning, KYC credentials, and transparent governance, XRPL is showing that compliance and openness can coexist. It redefines what decentralization means. It's not about excluding oversight. It's about distributing trust. Regulators oversee the parameters, but not every transaction. Institutions retain autonomy while operating on shared, transparent infrastructure. That's the concept of institutional DeFi in a nutshell. Public infrastructure, private compliance. It's a new paradigm. And the next test will come with the introduction of confidential MPTs using zero-knowledge proofs. That will allow private transactions with auditability. Institutions will be able to hide commercial details while still providing regulators with full visibility. That balance of privacy and accountability could unlock sectors like syndicated lending, private equity, and over-the-counter derivatives, all on-chain. Exactly. And the timing coincides with the broader move toward programmable money under Basel III post-2026. Banks will soon need to automate treasury operations and collateral management. XRPL's deterministic settlement and programmable RLUSD fit right into that evolution. Programmable treasuries could change monetary policy transmission. Instead of waiting for quarterly adjustments, liquidity and collateral could automatically rebalance in response to rate changes. Of course, that creates new systemic risks. If automated treasuries all react simultaneously, we could see flash liquidity events. But circuit breaker protocols and coordination between regulators and validators could mitigate that. It's fascinating how Ripple's ecosystem sits at the intersection of innovation and stability. They've managed to create tools that regulators can live with and institutions can actually use. Which is why Europe is such an important proving ground. It's the only region right now with the regulatory framework, market sophistication, and policy openness to host this kind of evolution. The next year will be pivotal. The rollout of XRPL's native lending protocol, the launch of confidential MPTs, and further integration of Ripple Prime's credit services will show whether this architecture can scale without losing its integrity. And if it does, we may well see the first public ledger infrastructure formally recognized by the BIS and ECB as compliant with the principles for financial market infrastructures. That would mark the true arrival of institutional blockchain. The implications go beyond finance. It would redefine how trust, compliance, and value transfer operate globally, public, auditable, and programmable. Just a reminder, remember to like, share, and subscribe. And also, don't forget there is a front row seat waiting for you. Join us here at the VIP area. Thank you, Monica. That's the transformation we're witnessing. Ripple's combination of regulated components, custody, stablecoin, and tokenization forms a complete system where every layer is auditable and interoperable. And that's what gives it credibility. Institutions don't just need technology. They need assurance, stability, and governance. Ripple delivers that through design, not marketing. It's ironic that the system born from decentralization ideals is finding its strongest expression in regulated institutional settings. But perhaps that's the natural trajectory. True adoption happens when technology meets compliance halfway. Ripple just did it earlier than everyone else. The next step will be multi-ledger integration. XRPL's collaboration with Wormhole and its upcoming EVM sidechain will connect Ethereum and Solana ecosystems directly to institutional corridors. That creates a multi-ledger liquidity mesh. Which will make liquidity even more efficient. Institutions will be able to route transactions across ledgers seamlessly, with Ripple Prime managing unified collateral and margin across them. That's the vision, a connected liquidity web that eliminates fragmentation while maintaining compliance. If successful, it could become the blueprint for future financial infrastructure, a hybrid network where transparency, efficiency, and regulation coexist. And that's where Ripple's real strength lies. It's not just solving payments. It's re-engineering the financial backbone of an entire continent. Drop comments below and subscribe to our channel. David and I are personas to make content more engaging and relatable, not legal and financial advice. Do your own research before making any investment decisions.
By the way, if you're following the European regulatory scene, keep an eye on upcoming MICA implementation updates and the ECB's next DLT pilot results. Those developments could decide how fast tokenized finance becomes mainstream. See you next time.